Good morning, everybody. It's amazing that Naaman would say the things he says about me. Uh, you can pay me later. <laughs> so I just think about my life and the things I've done in my life, and I go, wow, for you to say that. It's only because of Jesus, you know? It's only because of Jesus. And funny enough, if it wasn't for one guy who, who came to me in a bar my fourth night in a row and said to me, after I'd been contemplating how bored I was and knowing that this evening was going to work out exactly like I knew it was, it was the fourth night in a row, he came up to me and he was the bouncer of this bar and said to me, hey Mark, is this doing anything for you? I said, it's funny you should say that. It's doing nothing for me. He said, let's go to church. It was 32 years ago. And here we are today. By the grace of God. Thank you, Naaman. By the grace of God. I'm as faulty as the next person. But by the grace of Jesus, we can be secure in the knowing that he loves us. So before I start today, guys. Sorry? Who was the bouncer? Hey, who was the bouncer? The bouncer was Peter Manning. Who knows Peter Manning? Peter Manning, he was the bouncer of Joe Cools. Yeah. Don't get on the wrong side of Peter Manning. But I made sure I, made sure I was his mate. <laughs> yeah, Peter, what an amazing guy. Became a pastor in this church and then went and pastored the church up in Dundee. Incredible what God's done in his life. So before I start today, I really just want to use this platform, if I may, just to go back in April, I, I preached last, and for some of you that would have been here on the men's group, I would have shared with you the journey my family have been on in the last year. And my wife was here in the first service, she's now just left, but you'll remember that Dee's been on a journey for a year with cancer, and in April when, we, when I preached, I preached about, you know, there might be three different storms, and uh, you know, how do we handle the three different storms? And I don't know if you remember, I said this. I said, you know, we're going into another season now where I've got to trust God as to how I'm going to handle the next season. Because in May, Dee had to face an operation, last part of the process. Um, I don't know if you remember me sharing that. Well, we went up and Dan had the operation. And everything went south. Everything. One operation from here to here turned into two operations from here to here. Struggled with this. And I felt God say to me, well, remember you preached about how we're going to handle the storms. Well, this is the time for you to rest. Sure. My default is to fight, is to challenge. God showed me how to rest in this time, in this environment. And it was an un, unapologetic environment. Okay. We came back. D recovered after three weeks. We then go and see a GP to have his staples taken out. And by the grace of God, he picks up something. We have an x-ray. And would you believe this? That they had left a swab behind. No. This, this size. Not an earbud, a swab. We found ourselves having to go back up to Pretoria for the third operation. Wow, did Jesus put me to the test because Mark wanted a fight. Rest in me, rest in me, rest in me. In this, my wife was in church today. The results came back. My wife is totally cured from cancer. Jesus is a great God. He's a great God. So I wanted just to take this opportunity to say thank you, Emmanuel Church. We are doing life together, and you as a family drew alongside us. You prayed with us. You supported us. You showed us love. You went out of your way to spend time praying, giving us meals. We offer my family, I just want to say thank you. We were really, really touched. Bless you guys. That's the heart of God. Emmanuel is the heart of God. We can see that. We've experienced that. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, I've, got some, I've got three good friends here today. I want to just mention Zach. Zach, can you just put up your hand? 
Blessing and Alex. These guys are legends, eh? Yeah. These guys look after the bike and bean. And I want, I want you to know, if you ever think you're going for a surf or a coffee, just know your car's going to be safe. He's actually in. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We really appreciate it, eh? Also, just want to say quickly to my family, my daughter Sarah and Josh, my son-in-law, my mom and dad, you can now leave. Thanks for supporting me. We always thought there was no one going to arrive today, so I always get my family to come in and back me up. Uh, the seats are full, so thank you. Right, let me get into it. You know, for a while now, I have found God challenging me on certain things. And I just want you to know, when I, when I preach and I share something with you, it comes from a lesson that I've had to learn or am learning. So please don't look at me preaching down to you. I'm preaching with you, if that makes sense. So God tends to show these things to me that become so alive in my heart, and I just feel, well, if it was good for me, it might be good for you too. So I'm going to share that today. I have found God challenging the condition of my heart, the way I do church. Now, I'm not talking about how I act here on a Sunday morning, okay? I'm talking about how I do church from Monday to Sunday. Am I really bringing the essence and the true heart of God wherever I go? Because the mission of Jesus was to bring the love of Jesus wherever we went. Correct? Now, who of you are Christians here today? Oh, that's lucky. Great. Do you know that it's your mission too? We are part of that mission. We are not excluded from the mission of Jesus. Interesting, hey? Maybe I should just put my glasses on. So what I want to do today is challenge the way you think about church, okay? By sharing the very heart of God and the mission of Jesus. Because as I said, we're all part of that. When you look at the gospel, you will find that the tax collectors, the worst of the worst sinners, the murderers, the adulterers, all liked Jesus. They liked him. And Jesus loved them back. Why was that? Why was it that the worst of the worst in our society would be drawn to Jesus and the Bible says they liked him? Quite amazing, huh? Many years back, I had the privilege. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, intrigued about the whole mafia story and Alcatraz. And, and on my travel some years ago, I had the privilege of going to Alcatraz. And on the day we went to Alcatraz, it was actually quite amazing. Um, there was a guy there that was an ex-inmate signing his autobiography. So I stood in the queue and I wanted to meet this guy. And I eventually got to the front of the queue. And, and this guy gave me 25 minutes. It was actually profound. I wasn't following Jesus the way I should be following him. i have taken a bit of a sabbatical. <laughs> Anyone had a sabbatical with Jesus? <laughs> Don't do it. Um, so I started talking to this guy. His name was Whitey Thompson. Now I was intrigued by the fact that I'm now meeting an ex-inmate of Alcatraz. So many movies made of Alcatraz. So Whitey gets talking and he has to tell me your story and he starts telling me about himself. He was a murderer. He killed somebody at the age of 26. Went in and out of penitentiaries and he would say to me, you know, the short man with gray hair and tattoos and he said to me, oh Mark, they put me in this penitentiary and they put me in that penitentiary and they never broke my spirit. He was quite proud of that. But then the next sentence he said, but Mark, don't look at me as a hero. Look at me as somebody that Jesus has just forgiven. He said it a number of times. He said, I was this guy. When I got to Alcatraz, it was the last stop for any inmate. When I was at Alcatraz, I was known as the collector. Have you ever watched those gangster movies? You know that bad, bad oak in prison? He was that oak. He was that oak. He ran the prison. So known as the collector, and I'll give you an example of what he told me. He said to me, let's say... Naaman borrowed a, a box of cigarettes from me, okay? It was time for Naaman to pay it back. 
So I went to Naaman and I said, Naaman, how's my box of cigarettes? And Naaman being bigger than me, fighter, he said, no, I'm not going to give you a cigarette. And Whitey would say to me, Mark, the biggest thing in prison was to save face. You had to save face. If you didn't save face, you'd be dead the next morning. So I would go to Whitey. Whitey, I've got a problem with Naaman. What's the problem, Mark? This is it. Owes me cigarettes. Okay, I'm going to sort him out. You owe me now. That was this guy. He said he had such a rage and a hatred for people that if the guard walked past the prison doors, he would lunge out and just demonically grab him and, and just rearrange his face. That's the hatred he had for people. He would then visit Naaman and he would take all those good looks away. He would rearrange them in a proper way. That was Whitey Thompson. And I remember walking away from there saying to myself, wow, I'm actually not that bad. I've never killed anyone. I've never beaten anyone up like this. Just God must love me more. Wow. What a morally legalistic attitude I had. And I said, wow. For God, for this guy to have such an incredible encounter with our Jesus, to the point where the evil of the most highest evil was just taken away and his whole life was changed. He became an evangelist for the ghettos. And I said to him, I said to him, Whitey, what changed in your life? How did you meet Jesus? You know what he said to me? He said to me, it took a lady to notice me. A lady to have the courage to come to me and show me the love of Jesus. Not tell me that I was a murderer, a convicted felon, but that Jesus, there was hope in Jesus. I thought that was profound. Yeah, now I look back and I go, wow. How could I, pro how could I possibly take in that moral high ground? It's only because of Jesus. What a story, hey guys? What Jesus can do. When you look at Jesus, Jesus was a rabbi and a teacher. And if you think of Jesus and his heart, Jesus, I would have thought that Jesus would have got on with the Pharisees like a house on fire. You know when you have common ground? These guys had common ground. They knew the scriptures. They knew the word back to front. I would have thought it would have been amazing. I'd sit there and hey, I got this scripture. Now you got that scripture. Oh, but what about this and what about that? But in actual fact, Jesus was the total opposite with the Pharisees. Everything they stood for in terms of their religious belief and laws, Jesus stood against. To such an extent that he actually got them so angry. And this toxic, moralistic high ground that they took was so toxic that it actually drove them to kill Jesus. Something to think about. The way Jesus was. Jesus was always drawn to the people outside of the church, outside of the faith. The murderers, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, all gravitated toward Jesus. Why was that? Why was that? You see, Jesus had no time for religion. Jesus was about kindness, about love, about goodness. He was so anti-religion in his attitude and his actions. The fact that he noticed them and that he gave them time relational time they were able to see his love his love that made it his mission to seek the lost but here's the tension that exists today and i'm sure you're going to agree with me here if you're a believer and you live in the body of christ this church what was true of jesus personally should also be true of us shouldn't it how he carried himself and the heart he had for others should also be true of us. But here's the thing, guys. We have this reputation problem. We have this reputation problem. What if I get seen talking to an alcoholic? What if I get seen talking to an adulterer? Or what about a murderer? What would the church think of me what would my friends think of me? My reputation, the association could bring me down. 
could taint my reputation. Have we ever thought like that? I've thought like that. We are so worried about the negative association that is attached to people that aren't part of our faith that it actually brings us short of the true heart of Jesus. Because Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus' heart broke for those people that were outside of the church. He yearned for them to be connected again with him. And do you know what I think? So should we. How many times have you spoken to people in the church or outside of the church? Why don't you go to church? I've heard so many people say to me, Mark, the reason why I don't go to church is because I was so offended by that Christian or that person that calls himself a Christian in church. That should break our heart, guys. That should break our heart for the lost. Don't you think that sometimes we as Christians think we can be the judgmental ones? We can show a little bit of meanness or harshness uh, because of where we stand with Jesus and, and you don't. I don't think that's the portrayal of the heart of Jesus, do you? This should absolutely break our hearts because it's definitely not the heart of Jesus. And it's not God's disposition of those relationally disconnected with Him. God's heart breaks when people are not connected to Him. And this is the very reason why Jesus came. Look how the Pharisees spoke of Jesus. I'm going to just look at Luke 15. It says here, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, and they did this in a very derogatory way. They said, This man, he welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. This was the Jesus, the man who calls him the Messiah. You know, in those days, if you sat and had a meal with somebody... It was a big deal. Because that meal represented a fellowship and deep connection. And their disgust of Jesus was that Jesus would go and sit with sinners and eat with them. That was the Jesus that we serve. They saw themselves morally superior because of how they obeyed the law better than anyone else. They saw themselves morally superior because of what they thought their love of Jesus was how great their love of Jesus was. And this is exactly what fueled that toxic attitude and eventually the death of Jesus. Let's just take a moment just to think about this now. The Pharisees, Jesus. Has anyone watched the, their series called The Chosen? Mm, no. Anyone watch it? If you haven't, guys, watch it. It's brilliant. It's an absolute brilliant portrayal, almost like an exact portrayal of the scripture and how Jesus was. And we're at a part now, Dan and I, where we, we, we're watching the scene where the Pharisees are becoming really indignant about Jesus. And when I'm watching this, I'm looking at this and going, gee, how could the Pharisees have been so upset with Jesus when he went and he healed the lamb, the, the lamb, the lamb, the lame man at the well? They were so angry with him because he did it on the Sabbath. I thought, gee, how could the guys have been so unfair to Jesus? And I started thinking, and I felt God pressing my heart, saying, well, haven't you been like that? So I need to get honest and say to myself, wow. And here's a challenge to you. Have you ever had an inclining of moral superiority, superiority or felt better than someone else because you lead a home group, because you know the Bible better than anyone else, you tithe, you don't sleep around like that girl sleeps around, or that guy sleeps around. Have we ever had that feeling of moral superiority? Guys, I want to tell you it's exactly the same thing as the Pharisees. It's not the heart of God. Have you ever looked down on someone because of their profession? Or what they do in terms of their wealth, their accolades? Again, same thing as the Pharisees. Guys, I've got to share this story with you. <laughs> I, walk, I, I drive out of my house and I'm in my road. And I think I'm in quite a safe neighborhood. And um, <laughs> at the end of my road, th there's this girl with blonde hair standing in a pink top and pink jeans. And she's doing this. 
And the first thing I thought was, how could this possibly be? It's 12 o'clock on a Friday lunchtime. That could be my beautiful daughter standing there hitching at the mercy of whoever picks her up. I thought, no, man. So I stopped the car. I said, hey, what are you doing hitchhiking here? She said, no, I, I just live up the road. I, I, need, I, I need a lift. I said, well, please jump in. I'll take you. As we're driving, we've got the music going. And it, 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 I've got praise and worship music going. And she feeds into this, oh, you're a Christian. And I love this music. And yo, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so where do you stay? So just up the road. So I go up the road. <laughs> then it's the left. And then it's the right. And I'm thinking, whoa, hang on. What's going on here? Then we're going down a, a dead end. We get to the end of the dead end. I said, where's your house? I just haven't clicked. So my house is back there. So we, so we go back and she says, why don't you come in? And I just realized, I picked up a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> but how's this now? How's this? So she goes, all of a sudden, my heart rate starts racing. I start sweating, thinking, what have I done? What have I done? I phoned my wife. I said, love, you won't believe this. I just picked up a prostitute. Can you imagine how that went down? I, I was so worried about if somebody saw me. What would people say? Uh, what my wife would say? How they would read this? Gee, I thought about that and became so convicted by that. So convicted by that. What gives me the right to think I'm higher than her? What gives me the right to think that Jesus loves me more than he loves her? That wasn't Jesus' standpoint with prostitutes and tax collectors and murderers. That was never the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus was to love these people, to draw alongside them. So I'm the faultiest of faulty guys, um, and I, but I hope this is challenging you. Wow, we can get quite vulnerable, hey? You know, I watched Todd White. Does anyone know Todd White? He's preached in this church before. He's got an incredible ministry. I just watched the simple gospel that he carries, and it spoke to me. He was, he was doing a church, at least a, a street ministry. There were three witches there. They weren't, had, didn't have pointy hats. They were dressed in black, and, you know, and he knew they were witches, and, and God gave him a picture and, about the one lady, her back had a problem, and... So he went up to her and he said to her, my name's Todd White. He says, I, I love Jesus. And they went, we are witches. She says, yes, I know. He said, but God's told me that you've got a back problem and, 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 and Jesus, my Jesus, wants to just heal you. She said, but did you hear me? I am a witch. He says, I know that. But my Jesus loves you. And then he did the unthinkable. <laughs> he got the other two witches to lay hands on the one witch and pray for them. <laughs> How amazing is that? And this lady's life was changed. She was healed. Jesus met her. He didn't go there and say to her, listen, what you're doing is wrong. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to repent. He went straight to the love of Jesus and he brought the love of Jesus. Jesus does the rest. He convicts the heart later. It's not for you and I to convict that heart. Beautiful, hey? So, if we had to be honest, in the name of religion, I think we're all susceptible to missing the real heart of Jesus. Would you agree? <clears throat> there's a preacher that I saw, and I've taken a lot of this preach, of what I'm sharing with you today from this preach. There's a pastor that looks after a church called Woodstock City in Atlanta. His name is Samir Masad. What a beautiful man. He, he talks about the story. Who loves, who loves golf? I shouldn't put my hand up. Okay, there's one oak that loves golf. You, you'll know that golf is full of rules, eh? When you go to a golf course, you have the right shoes, you've got to have the right outfit. There's an etiquette that you need to follow, okay? It's got to be quiet, one oak hits at a time. He talks about this golf course in the States called Sweeten's Cove. It's a nine-hole golf course, and they pride themselves in being an anti-golf golf course. So they have no rules. No rules. So you can have 15 guys at the 14th hole all teeing off at the same time. In no shoes, shorts, baggies, 
don't even think that says you've got to have a, a shirt on. <laughs> but do you know when they open it up for registration, for membership registration to play on this course, it is sold out in 15 minutes. How's that? So it made me think. Their mission was to get rid of all the peripheral stuff that has robbed the true beauty and meaning of golf. They've taken it away. So you can just enjoy hitting that ball down the fairway. Isn't it amazing? Now Jesus, if you look at Jesus, Jesus was a religious rabbi and teacher, but yet was the most anti-religious person of the first century. He detested religion. He turned it upside down. Guys, I'll say that again. He detested religion. Because he saw that religion and all that peripheral stuff actually was holding people back from the true beauty of what it is to be in a relationship with Jesus or God our Father. So that's why he could never relate with the Pharisees. Jesus was and still to this day is not interested in a religious system that breeds self-righteousness and creates these silos of good and bad people. That was never the heart of Jesus. Or a system where you feel you have to earn favor to be loved by Jesus. It sounds shocking, doesn't it? Let me tell you, I, you know, I have a very close person that I love. Let's call him Sam. No, let's call him John. John would tell me that in his church, they seat the biggest tither here, the second biggest tither there, the third, fourth, and off they go down. That's how you seat it in the church. And you treat it differently. So if you're sitting here, you'll be treated differently too if you're sitting there. Because I know you give more to the church, so I'm going to give you more time and attention and favor than you at the back. How's that? That's happening today. I also was so shocked by what John did. John loves the church. He loves God. He did the unthinkable. At 77 years old, he hit his wife of 80 years old. Unthinkable. He paid the price. He paid the price. But you know what the church did? The church banned him from praise and worship. The church banned him from prayer meetings. They banned him from sitting here in the front. He had to sit in the back. He wasn't allowed to mix with anyone in the church until he had been cleansed. How ridiculous does that sound, guys? Thank you, Jesus, that I was never treated like that. Thank you, Jesus, that God saw my heart, that I repented, and he set me free. Thank you that he loved me as I came, like he loves you as you came. Jesus, what an amazing Jesus. Jesus goes on further. If you look at Luke, he speaks about the three parables. You know the parable of the 99 sheep, where the one went missing? Jesus uses this parable as an illustration of how we should be towards the lost. And let me just explain it to you for a while. So there's a shepherd out there. He, 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 he comes back and he's lost one sheep. He counts only 99. He leaves these sheep and he goes out and he finds that lost sheep. You know the story. Okay? Now I don't know about you guys, but none of us here are... Anyone a shepherd here? No. Okay? I think if it was me, and I brought back 99 sheep, I'd probably think, well, whew, well you know, I had, I've got 99, man. I don't have to worry about the other one. And actually, I was planning on the 98th one to put it on the spit <laughs> while I watched the rugby. That would probably be my take on things. But, but as a shepherd, a shepherd would never think that. A shepherd and an agriculturalist would know the value of just that one lost sheep. And they would do everything in their power to go out and find that sheep and then come back and throw a celebration on the fact that they found this lost sheep. How amazing is that? Now, do you remember the story of, of the woman with the 10 silver coins? She loses one. She sweeps the house. She looks under the bed. She look, she's frantically looking 
for this one lost coin. I think Jesus wants us to have that same emotional intensity for those that are lost. Because actually, the ones that are not lost are not really his concern. His concern are the ones that are lost. It's like, you know that emotional response when you lose your wallet? Oh, I've got to find my wallet. Somebody's going to steal my money. And I'm looking everywhere for this wallet. That same intense emotional reaction. Can you imagine if we had that for that one person in our church or our community or our home or our work that was so lost and didn't know Jesus? Imagine if we put that energy and focus into that one person. Somebody did that for me. Peter Manning did that for me at that bar 32 years ago. Changed my life. There's a beautiful lost parable, the parable of the lost son. Would you mind putting it up, uh, guys? Thank you. I, I love this parable, and we've all heard it so many times, but I want to read it to you. Jesus continued, this is in Luke 15, verse 7. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So, the, so he divided this property and he gave it to him. Guys, in the time of that culture, it was like saying, this was the unthinkable. It was like saying, Dad, you're as good as dead to me. So you might as well just give me my inheritance now so I can get on with life. That's what he was saying. You know the story. Not long after that, the younger son got together, all he had, set off in a distant country, and he squandered everything. The country fell into famine. He had no food. He had no clothes. He had squandered everything. To make it worse, he landed up in a, in a pig star, working with the pigs. As a Jewish man, again, that was unthinkable because that was the uncleanliness of things to do. But he was so hungry, he was even forced to even eat what the pigs ate. And then it says this. The next slide. Thank you, guys. It says this. After he had spent everything, there was a severe... Okay. So he went out and hired himself out of a city in the country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Sorry, the next slide. Listen to this. The parable goes, when he came to his senses, he said, right, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to confess to my father what a bad son I've been. I'm going to ask for his forgiveness. And then I'm going to ask him if he can just give me something to do, something to eat. But... The fact that he came to his senses makes me think about the heart of Jesus. He remembered the goodness and the kindness of his father in a time that he thought was a point of no return. And literally, this man was at a point of no return. He had done something so bad that he couldn't possibly come back, but he remembered the heart of his father, the goodness and kindness of his father. Are you with me, guys? And this is what happened. Verse 18. Sorry, if we can go to the next slide. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. It was like the father was waiting for him. Every day he got onto his porch and he looked with his binoculars. Where's my boy? Where's my boy? Where's my boy? And then he saw him coming. And when he came, he saw him and he was filled with, what do you think you would put in there? If somebody did this to you, if somebody hurt you in the church, if somebody robbed you at work, if somebody mistreated you, what would you put in there if that person came back and said, I'm sorry? Would you put there, his father saw him and was filled with unforgiveness, mm. hatred, Disappointment. Because what you put in that block there is a sure sign of the condition of your heart and the heart of the church. Because if it says those things, then we're not doing the mission of Jesus. And we're not displaying the very essence of the heart of Jesus. But the Bible does say, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. The son tried to say, Dad, I'm sorry. And all the father did was quickly put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger, 
Let's love him. Let's give him the best of the best. Guys, that's the Jesus we serve. And the very reason why I'm standing here today is because Jesus put a robe on me. He put a ring on my finger. He didn't sit there and tell me everything I did wrong. He loved me. He loved me to a point where I love him now. Amazing, isn't it? It's a beautiful story. You see, prodigal, prodigal son, the lost son, also known as the prodigal son. Prodigal means recklessly extravagant, having spent everything. And this is what I love about a famous author and pastor of a church in, in the States, a guy by the name of Tim Keller. Does anyone know Tim Keller? Incredible man of God. He says that perhaps we should have called, it's not the prodigal son, but the prodigal God. Think about that. The extravagant love and grace of Jesus, of every person that's fallen. Where Jesus spent, where God spent everything giving his son up to die for you and I. There's no greater price that could have been paid. The prodigal God, he was recklessly, he is recklessly extravagant with his love and his grace for you. So guys, how can we possibly take the moral high ground when it comes to those that we feel are just inferior to us? Wouldn't be the heart of Jesus. If your vision of religion has created silos, Jesus would want you to get rid of that. Let's get rid of it. And understand that you too, remember, were saved by grace once. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't be here. Jesus said, I've come to save the lost. And I really believe that's our mission too. We should save the lost. Like Jesus, we should be on a mission. A real mission. To take all that religious stuff and chuck it away. I had somebody come to me this morning and say to me, am I allowed to wear my cap in the church? Of course you're allowed to wear your cap in the church. Let's get rid of all that religious stuff. And show the love of Jesus. Amen? So, here's a challenge, guys. What can we practically do? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, you know what? I'm actually too old. I'm retired. I've done my thing. You know? I, I, I don't have the energy. And also, too, you know what? I'm not an evangelist. and a, I don't know the scriptures as well as you do. So, you know what? I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to receive every Sunday. And I'm going to let the youngsters do all that stuff. <laughs> Guys, it's as simple as this. If we love Jesus, we need to be on the same mission as Jesus. And the difference we can make is as simple as this. Inviting someone to church that doesn't know Jesus. Simple as that. Inviting someone to church. That happened to me. How about making that one person feel really loved and accepted? Regardless of the way they dress, how they talk, how they smell. How's that for a challenge? How about forgiveness that manifests in true freedom? Imagine that. I have a friend of mine who in the car park at a canoe club on a Thursday night, which was party night, came up to me and said, I've got a drinking problem. I said, okay, so I worked. She said, no, I, I, I want you to pray for me. So I prayed for him in the car park. He was the partiest of partiest animals. First guy in, first guy out, last guy out. Had a following like you cannot believe. That night, God delivered him from alcohol. Incredible. It's been 10 years now. 10 years now. What an amazing guy. A simple man, but a heart full of God. I look at him. He doesn't know the scriptures. He loves Jesus. He has a faith that I've, I just really see in, in, in a lot of people. Uh, he doesn't go to church, but he, he loves Jesus. And I see him on most nights at the club, the canoe club, sitting in the bar, buying his friends beers while he drinks water. I wouldn't recommend that for any recovering alcoholic. But he does it, and they 
cannot get over the fact that he does not drink and party like he does. But then the time comes when they say to him, so how did your life change? And he's out the starting blocks like a racehorse. Let me tell you about what Jesus did in my life. Man, that's church. That's church. To this day now, 10 years later, three of his mates that were alcoholics have all come out of that, been through here, have been found Jesus, just by the way he is. Beautiful, eh? So when we see these people outside of our faith, as Jesus does, and align our hearts with the Father's heart, this is the way we can change the reputation of the church. And this is how we can live the true mission of God. So church, I hope this has been challenging. I want to encourage you. Let's go on a mission to fill these seats with people that are not saved. To fill these people that would probably be classified as probably the dreads of society. Let's get those people in here, man. Let's share the love of Jesus with them. Where they can feel comfortable and experience a true connection with our Father. Wouldn't that be amazing? Bless you guys. I hope this has touched your heart and I hope it's challenged you. Thank you so much for listening. So, can I ask you to stand? I'm just going to pray. And if it's your heart, you can pray softly or not. I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the love that you have for us, for each and every one of these people here today. We know, Jesus, that your heart to bring those that are disconnected in a relationship with you back again with this connection. Jesus, you have poured out your love, your amazing wisdom. You've given us your Holy Spirit. Father, teach us to use this in the mission for Jesus. Mm. Father, give us the energy, the confidence, just the will and desire to bring those that are lost. And Father, so that you can do your work. Father, give us the ability to love beyond the sin. To love beyond the mistakes of others. And just to bring you, Jesus. Just to bring you. I pray you'll bless everybody here today as they go their separate ways. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.